Hello, everyone. Thanks to Nicholas um, for the launching the project, which is very timely for me. Um, James Klugman. I, I think I first started to take an interest in, in James Klugman when I was doing my PhD, a serious interest. And I think for a lot of people who either writing about the Communist Party in the last years or who, or who joined the Communist Party in the last years, James Klugman was known as being the editor of Marxism Today before Martin Jakes and as the party's official historian. But little was said, to some extent, about his earlier life, which remained a mystery, uh, not least because he himself was quite reticent to talk about it, although he opened up a bit towards in, in his final years. What did one know about him? Eric Hobsbawm, who knew him better than most, has written. He gave nothing away. Well, he came from an affluent Jewish background in Hampstead, Belsize Park area, of Hampstead, his father came from Germany in the 1890s, was a merchant, came with, over with his brother. His mother was from a um, long established Rosenheim family, uh, was born in Hampstead, but again, parents were from Germany, a family of tea and uh, wine merchants. His father was a Liberal Party voter. Um, the only time he voted Labour was in 1931, and it didn't do him any good, his son uh, would say later. Um, he was very keen for his children to get a good liberal education, I think for him, as a way of assimilating into, let's say, a bourgeois liberal society. And he took education very seriously. And certainly, the educational experiences of his daughter, Kitty, James's elder sister, who herself, uh, I think, deserves some more research. And James was very important. Of course, they assimilated themselves into a different kind of society from the one that the father was, was hoping for. Um, but it was crucial in both cases. Kitty went actually to Kingsley School in Belsize Park at the end of their road. Anybody knows about this school? It was set up by um, Lizzie Susan Stebbing, the philosopher, the first British woman philosopher, and some friends. Um, and it was a very radical, independent uh, school, taught Kitty how to think, turned her into a philosopher. Um, opposite, James Norman, as he was still known, at home, went to the Hall Prep School. And I sometimes wonder when, in 1926, which is James's last year at the Prep School and Kitty's last year at Kingsley School, uh, as they were walking up the road, Kitty, under the influence of Susan Stebbing, who had defended the strikers in that year, the general striker that year, and James Klugman had written his first poem at Prep School in 1926 about general strike, or at least mentions the general strike. I wonder what they were talking about as they, as they made that journey. If we go into the 1930s, at the beginning of the 1930s, James Klugman... Uh, moves from the Hall School, sorry, he's already moved to the Hall School. He's at the, his last uh, year at Gresham's, uh, which a very progressive uh, liberal institution at that time, significant, I think, in the um, lives of many uh, uh, subsequent communists. Um, the headmaster, Eccles, was carrying on a liberal tradition. A lot of um, liberal parliamentarians sent their children there, civil servants, the Simons, the Floods, um, the children of newspaper editors uh, were there. The children of dentists, Benjamin Britten, was a contemporary of James Klugman, and who, of course, came from a, a merchant's uh, business background. It was progressive, uh, Gresham's, because they had what they call the honours system, which, in which pupils would promise uh, to the headmaster, to the head of house, uh, a series of responsibilities and duties in the place of punishment and more punitive responses in other public schools. And it would foster a sense of individual responsibility, of civic duties, public spiritedness uh, amongst the pupils. It was the first school, I think, to set up the uh, UN society. You had a debating society um, and a sociological society, which uh, made very brief um, introductions to the working class, uh, visits to the mustard factory up the road and to the homeless in the West End, but nothing too substantial in that kind of experience for him. But for other pupils, it was quite a repressive as well as progressive experience. W.H. Auden had been a pupil just before Klugman arrived, and although he was um, sympathetic to many aspects of the school, found the repressive atmosphere encouraged by the honor system a bit overwhelming. Our moral life, he said, was based on fear, or fear of the community, not to mention the temptation it offered to the natural informer. And fear is not a healthy basis. It makes one furtive and dishonest and unadventurous. The best reason I have for opposing fascism is that, is that at school I lived in a fascist state. I mean, we can say it's um, an exaggeration, but certainly for Klugman, he found it repressive. He was, he said, an oddity. He was not 
in the headmaster's house, the kind of chosen um, group of probably uh, elite pupils, although he himself excelled at school as he had at um, prep school. At his prep school, he was described by the headmaster as one of the brightest boys ever to go through the doors, and he won all the prizes at Gresham's as well. Like Benjamin Britten, he refused to join the officer training corps. Anybody, any, anybody seen the film Peace and Conflict, Tony Britton's f- film, about the, the kind of origins of Benjamin Britten's pacifism as a character based on Klugman in that, in that film and gives some indication of how, how significant, um, in a sense, the legacy of the First World War was still hanging over the school. Many pupils lost their lives, many, many former Gresham's pupils lost their lives. But the biggest influence for James Klugman at Gresham's was from his teacher, his, normally his French teacher, Frank McEachran, um, who really taught the history of ideas European literature introduced him to the early writings of Marx, was also been a big influence on order. And he was a much bigger influence on James Klugman, and, and I think inspired in him this sense of um, uh, forward from liberalism that he later adopted, you know, the, the progressive idea of the Enlightenment, and introduced, as I say, Marx. Though McEachran himself was not noticeably left wing, he was liberal anarchist in many ways, quite often in conflict with the uh, school authorities. He was an inspiring teacher, he went beyond. The curriculum, he wasn't somebody who delivered learning outcomes in today's uh, language of higher education. As James Krugman said, he opened our minds to new horizons, new excitements, and roused interest and imagination in books. McEachran was the model for Hector in Alan Bennett's The History Boys. And, um, I mean, later left the college uh, after having some, not for the reasons that Hector got into trouble with the, with the, with in, in the play, but he left the college and he went then went to... Um, Shrewsbury School, where he taught the private eye generation in, late, in later years. But he was obviously a remarkable uh, tutor and an inspiring, I think, influence on, on Klugman. And it was in this context, I think, inspired by his tutor, reject, rebelling against the school, that Klugman used, called, started to call himself a communist. Um, he didn't fully understand what it meant. He had read some marks. It obviously didn't mean to him then what it would mean to him later. But it was his, his way of being a rebel was to use this term. I think that he, he was already beginning to excel in small discussion circles, talking to his, his friends. Um, you know, uh, Donald McLean was his closest friend, the Simon brothers and others. And that was where he uh, developed his um, aptitude really for being a theoretician, for being able to explain lucidly um, political theory and philosophy and so on. Um, he then went from, from Gresham's to Cambridge. Uh, his sister was already there, um, had been there for a while, had influenced the writer, later writer Kathleen Rain, uh, had excelled at philosophy and married Morris Cornforth, who, of course, was a, uh, was a protege of Wittgenstein and another communist intellectual. So when Klugman arrived in Cambridge, he already had, if you like, a base. Uh, the Cornforths were in the centre of town organising the Communist Party branch there. He himself would go on with... Um, David Guest uh, to be the first, if you like, organizing group within the communist students. Um, Guest, as David, uh, Kevin mentioned, uh, Guest was, was really in the summer of 31 with Cornforth, had really uh, got, the, got the thing going, but in very low-key, um, modest ways, if you compare what happened later. Nevertheless, in the autumn of 1931, there were communist student organizations in the, at the LSE, um, uh, UCL and shortly followed in 1932 by the October Club. Um, so things, things were moving. And the key meeting uh, that took place that, got, that established a national CP um, organization, a student bureau, uh, set up the, the newspaper Student Vanguard, appear, uh, uh, took place in the Klugman's Hampstead home uh, in Easter 1932 when his parents were away. I should say that for all their rebellion, Many of the communists from this background, it's true also of Donald McLean, still had uh, this um, nervousness of their parents knowing about the politics. And it's very noticeable that James Klugman and McLean, who both were clearly uh, convinced communists by this time, didn't join until both their fathers had died. It wasn't the only reason, but it seems to me a kind of interesting aspect on the constant family quarrels. Donald McLean, who was close friends with Klugman, wouldn't bring Klugman back to the house. Uh, because, of, because of, the, of the politics, his father being a liberal parliamentarian. Um, Klugman joined himself in 1933, and it's, it's perhaps surprising it was so late. He'd just turned 21. His father had died 
um, Hitler was on the rise, all these, I think, were, were factors. He was sent on joining, as many communists were, to the Ronda Valley to see how uh, unemployed uh, workers lived. As, uh, that was the strategy at the time within the Communist Party leadership of middle class, uh, getting to know, getting, getting to know uh, working, class, working class lives. Um, the catalyst for the development in the Cambridge uh, Student Union was in the autumn of 1933 when John Cornford arrived at Cambridge uh, from the LSE, um, impetuous, outspoken, um, inspiring figure uh, who had died very young. And him and Klugen were a, were a dream ticket, if you like. They were a, a perfect combination of, on the one hand, the outspoken, agitational approach of Cornford and the gentle, genial uh, persuasive, conversational nature of Klugman. They were both, however, devoted. They were very politically engaged, would spend much of their time on politics, long discussions into the night, and they had probably two main objectives at that time, to build a strong anti-fascist uh, movement and to create a revolutionary organisation from quite a low base. And Kevin is absolutely right that the politics of the Popular Front, certainly in the case of Cambridge, arrived before, in the minds and approach of, of many communists, before the Seventh Congress. This was already, in a sense, it was Klugman's natural evolution to take that kind of politics. Um, and there were two main, main events, I think, which got the Cambridge movement going. One was the um, uh, demonstrations around armistice in, in uh, November 1933, including a showing of a military film, um, which inspired, I think, a lot of communists to join. The following year, the hunger marches um, took place. That was, again, a meeting experience, perhaps for the first time, with working class lives and the, and the organization that they're taking. Um, there were sectarian moments, however. Um, Keep Culture Out of Cambridge was um, uh, taken from a poem by John Cornford, a demonstration that he and Klugman took part in, a lonely personal demonstration, Klugman later described it, the last two lines of which was, Cornford was upset by the frivolity of some of the other poets and writers. All we've brought are our party cards, which are no bloody good for your bloody charades. Um, but the, the broad nature of the, of the politics was, as I say, was his, his natural um, political home, really. Um, okay, I've got a couple of minutes left. One thing I, I would say um, that was very distinctive about his political um, development at this time was a visit in 1934 by Willie Gallagher um, to the university. Gallagher, this great figure of great prestige, working class leader, was offended by the dress and language and revolutionary posturing, as he saw it, of some of the students. He told them, you should study hard. We need specialists, academics, writers. Only a few can be revolutionaries. Every, stu every communist student, a good student, was the slogan that was adopted at that time. Now, for Klugman, this is absolutely crucial because it was very profound. Somebody who was continuing to do very well at university, got ended with a double first, was already earmarked for a, for a, a fellowship, uh, would go on to study in, in Paris, as well as working for the Comintern. Um, this, was, this was very important. It meant he could be a communist intellectual. As late as October 1933, Palm Dutt, who of course was the established party theoretician, uh, in, a, in an address to intellectuals, said this, First and foremost, he, that is the intellectual, should forget he is an intellectual, except in moments of necessary self-criticism, and remember that only he is a communist. For Klugman, it's the opposite. You could be a communist and an intellectual, not an aloof uh, intellectual, not somebody cut off, if you like, from what was going on, duties to the party and the working class. Um, and these loyalties were ones, of course, which were very serious for him, would become serious for him, over the next decades, um, as the Cold War developed, 1956, um, and also in his case, a reluctant um, uh, recruitment by Soviet intelligence, which I'm not going to, uh, something that is beyond the scope of what we're discussing today. Um, more immediately, it let him, led him to work for the Comintern in Paris, uh, a sort of romantic life goal, perhaps, but one that was much admired by his contemporaries. Eric Hobsbawm, in his autobiography, said he would love to have been a communist organiser, but didn't have the organisational nous to do it. Um, it gives you some indication. Klugman was regarded as a sort of guru, Hobsbawm described him, and certainly him and Victor Keenan thought him the most uh, impressive Marxist scholar of that generation. Um, I've got a 
finish briefly, but he, he went to Paris to work for the World Student Association Against War and Fascism, which he, as the leader, later helped to rename the World Student Association for Peace, Freedom and Culture, trying to give a, a sort of positive liberation, liberation aspect to it. Um, it took in various places, people going to Spain, passing through, would stop in Paris, and it also took him to China uh, with Bernard Flood in 1938 and a student delegation to China where they saw the revolution at first, uh, part of the revolution at first hand. They interviewed Mao, who told them, you represent great numbers of students and youth. You have come to China, bring with you an important mission, a sympathetic voice of the world. It must be very inspiring Together. It's important to remember also that China was very important for the British left in the 1930s. People forget, uh, anybody who's read Tom Buchanan's late, uh, recent book, East Wind, will find, will find more about this. And it was certainly important for him. So at the end of that period um, of the 30s, uh, the last Congress of the RME finished in, 19, uh, a month before, in 1939, a month, be month before war broke out. He himself joined up on the agreement of the Comintern. I wanted to join up immediately, he had to wait until 1940. And his, you know, his, his story in the army is, is another interesting one we can't uh, go through here. But from somebody who was quite nervous at the beginning of the 30s, um, lacking in confidence in public speaking, by the end of the 30s, confident, uh, brave in many cases, a professional revolutionary, a communist intellectual, not without its the problems that would happen later. Perhaps at the end of his life, had lost a lot of that timid, to some extent tormented figure um, looking back at the 1930s. Thanks very much.